wait, this is my uh, girlfriend, Amy, who's a fan of yours, by the way. Oh, hi, Amy. How are you? I'm sorry. I didn't want to interrupt, but hello. Oh, don't worry. Now you definitely can't edit. Well, okay. I was supposed to move into my new apartment, which I found for like 425 euros. It was a two bedroom apartment. It's like half the price I pay for a two bedroom in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And I was waiting for that. And I made like a really nice chunk of money from my exhibit at the, um, at the gallery Martel. And it was, it was just perfect. You know, the work was coming in. It was, um, professionally all of my dreams came true but i i felt empty huh. it was the most bizarre thing i just went like is this really what i want and i realized that i had everything over there professionally what i always wanted but all the people that i love are here mm -hmm. so it was a no-brainer um that I still have the connections in France. I still have the gallery and the publishers and everything, but I don't have to live there. Like for the first time, I am completely in love with Canada, which is something I thought that would never happen. Yeah. Do you feel Canadian? Yes, I finally actually do feel Canadian. But, you know. I've been following, I've been following uh, your progress on, on social media and I gotta say, I remember, I remember the days when you were like posting shit like, "Fade the graphics will never publish me," and and shit. And here you are now. You have how many gazillion books published? You bought a house. You're almost yeah. married. Yeah. Like, you have a, such a beautiful life. I'm so happy for you. Yeah, I did good. No, you did. You, you know, you you've come far from uh, you know my hot date days. <laughs> That's still one of the most popular comics, though, you know. Did I tell you my kid was, like, 17 when I got that comic and I gave it to him to read it? Yeah. And I went to his room and he was on his bed like this. Why? He was so moved by your book that he, wow. he, like, he had to fucking digest it. Wow. Yeah, he was really hit by it. Like, I think it's a very important book for teens. Hmm, interesting. Uh, is it still in print? Uh, yeah. In fact, you know what's weird? They're doing a French version of it right now. They're they're translating it, and uh, it's gonna be funny to see how they do that because there's so much '90s slang in there. It's like, how are they gonna translate this into the French? The pager. The pager. Who knows what the pager is anymore, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, what's, what's the French word for fat? You know, P H A T. They don't use that. It's like... <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, I'm interested to see how it, how it turns out. But uh, how's your how's your reception been for this book? Good. It's been really good. Um, it uh, it was shortlisted at the Angoulême Festival, which was really an achievement of it on its own uh, because that's kind of like like under two percent of total number of books that are published in France of 5,000 titles so that was that was it was really successful in France and it won best book um, award at Luca Comics and Games oh, cool. um, that same year which I did not expect whatsoever. Um, I don't really know how the English edition is going, but I assume it's going well, simply because I just stopped following all of that stuff. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I do the same. I don't look at reviews of my stuff at all anymore, unless Jack sends it to me specifically, because uh, because I'm not going to Google my name. Like, just, I don't want to, you know, like... I'm not gonna do that. I don't want to see like you know a bunch of like mean stuff. I, I figure like if there's a good one, then Jack, the publicist, will just like send me the the review and I can read that. But I'm not gonna go on like Goodreads and like read what people are saying about my stuff. <laughs> it's like that's not healthy for you. I can't do that. 
No, that's not healthy. I used to do that a lot with the first two books because it was still new and you like you really have to look out for anything that you can use in your press release or anything like that. But once I like for busy men, it was a completely different thing. I think I just kind of it was a thing of novelty before. Mm-hmm. That's a you know with busy better. At one point, I decided to give very small number of interviews, and they were, you know, handpicked, so to speak. And when Fantagraphics edition came out, I, I said to Jacques, I said, please limit the number of interviews. Like, there's absolutely no need for interviews. The books don't need interviews. They need reviews, really. Yeah. Because I felt, for example, I got, when the Serbian edition came out, I got a list of questions from this woman from Serbia who was a journalist. And she sent me a list of questions. And the first question was, can you tell me more about your main character, Bezimena? And I'm like, have you read the book? (laughs) Have you read the book? And she was trying to, to, to begin a series of interviews with people that will raise awareness about sexual violence. And she didn't even fucking bother to read the book because the answer to all of her questions mm-hmm. would have been in the back in the afterward. So I asked her, like, did you read this book? And she said, no, I I was going to. I'm like, Uh, well, when you read the book, feel free to send me the questions again. I never heard back from her. So after that, I realized that because the, the, the whole subject of sexual violence and the way I approach it in a book, it can be misconstrued. It can be like, I don't want people to use that for political means. Mm. You know, I would like to raise the awareness, but I don't want people to use it to their their side type of thing. Or, you know, um, you have to be like I've been a big becoming increasingly aware of accountability and in, in what you write and how you write it and what you say publicly, even in uh, in my social media posts. Um, um, like I, I don't want to share negativity. I don't want to be, you know, that asshole on the Facebook that's passive aggressive and judgmental and stuff. Um, yeah, well, I understand. Like I, you know, like you were saying earlier, like when I, you know, probably when we first became friends on Facebook, <laughs> it's like the stuff I was posting. I was a young man at the time, so it was a lot yeah. of angst about like uh, of not feel, not being positive that I was going to be able to get to where I wanted to be within the comics industry. So I had all this angst and anxiety that was just like constantly like desperation. Just all my posts were like crazy. And now it's like, I, I just want to only share things that I really like. Like I'll share whatever I'm working on. If I'm like reading a book that I'm excited about, I'll share that. So I remember you posting about how like, you're like, I'm done with comics. And I (laughs) seen so many people, like so many cartoonists post that same thing. I'm just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And (laughs) I see what you're doing now and it's a comic. I know, I know. But like the next book I'm working on, since I'm not working on a little girl book, Mm -hmm. but the next book is really not going to be your conventional comic. It's going to be, if anything, reminiscent in approach and the look to Carl Jung's Red Book. So mm-hmm. it's going to be more of, um, you know, my reflections on 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 healing from trauma, sexual trauma, PTSD, uh, war, displacement, all the terrible things that have gone through in my life. Because you know, every once in a while. You know, I'll get an email from a young cartoonist and they will say, oh, I read Bezimena and I was so moved, I cried, I had a similar experience and I would like to write about it, what do I do? Hmm. And, And I get these often enough and considering what's going on in the world right now, I think there's going to be a lot more need for healing in a way. And I believe that people can really 
he, the, the people can heal through self-expression, through creativity, personal narrative. So this is going to be kind of like a guide through that and my own reflections of, of all of that. And so I don't know what it's going to look like, but... Um, well, you're just writing it now? Or how do you work? Do you write before you draw? Um, depends. I do... I sometimes I write, sometimes I draw. It depends. Um, all everything, but basically, what I'm taking now is all the notes and mini essays that I've written in the past four or five years while studying esoteric philosophy, um, Jungian analysis, dream work, Marie Louise von Franz alchemical approach to individuation and wow. all that stuff. So. I'm going to kind of create a visual collage, so like, you know, experimental visual poem out of this, and um, um, so it will probably be the most experimental approach I have I've done to comics so far, because I've always used intuition more than anything, going from, you know, three pages at a time, not knowing where the story is going. And this time I have like bits and pieces that are written, they're scattered all over, but I need to kind of like put them together visually and together with the tarot approach to the tarot that, that I've been studying and the tarot cards that I've designed recently and stuff, yeah. Oh yeah, that's my favorite one. That's the original one because I sold the rights to Jonathan Cape. Ooh. And that that's, yeah, that's a really, um, that's my favorite one. That's uh, such a great book, by the way. I, I, I don't know if you've ever told you that, but I really love that book. I've read it several times. It's oh, great. thanks. Thanks. Now, you know, I don't have your very first book. That's the one I'm missing. That you were serializing in Mineshaft? Yeah, that was uh, Heartless. Heartless. Now, that was published by Conundrum, which is a small Canadian publisher. And the Italian edition of Heartless is coming up. Um, it, it was supposed to come up in May, but they have postponed it to September, and now I hear it's probably a little bit later, which is fine, but it's an expanded edition. So it has some comic, short comics that I've done after, and wow. it has almost all the illustrations I've done since the original publication date in 2012. So the book will be thicker, much bigger. It has portraits of spiritual teachers and philosophers I did, and um, the text that accompanies each uh, portrait. So the book reads like a piece of poetry. Like I have a really good editor. And I was hoping to actually pitch that for the American edition. So. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll see how that goes because that could probably uh, go into production before I'm done with this book. You should so, do that. I would, yeah, I, I would like to see that stuff. Like one thing that really changed me, I used to be like really sheepish and kind of go like when I was working on, uh, when I was working on uh, reviewing the contract for Fatherland and I remember I sent it to my friend Mark, who is an entertainment lawyer, and he was looking through and he's like, do you want me to get you more money? I'm like, no, 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 it's enough, it's enough. Like, you know, that was me before. And now I'm like, from the get-go, I am going to tell them, the editors, the publishers, what my conditions are. Mm -hmm. and. I am sorry, if they're not good for you, I would rather the book not be published. I mean, there's certain things, I'm doing this for love. From now on, I'm just doing the works for love. And I'm slowly moving into the area where I do not wish to depend on graphic novels alone. I mean, I make money from the sales of originals, and as long as I produce pretty good drawings, you know, I'll be able to make money. I'm kind of tired of the whole game mm -hmm. in the publishing industry and, and, and us, like, I was talking about this on, on Gil's podcast on uh, the virtual memories about 
how um, the the profits from the book are divided between the artist, the distributor, the bookshops, the publisher, and we get the least. We get 10%. And I'm like, actually, when was it 10%? It's usually like 8%. So... Uh, when when you exhibit at the gallery, your ga- the gallery owner will take 50%, which leaves you with 50%. And of course they have to. They have to pay rental for the space and stuff. But 8 to 10% from a book, mm-hmm. that's criminal. So yeah. because it's fucking criminal... Sorry, you gotta meet me on my own terms. I will let you rob me, but I will not let you rob my creativity. And and I will not wait here for the crumbs to fall off your table. And I will not keep reminding you to pay me. You gotta really kind of have this feeling of self-worth and, and, and engage in it. Because obviously you're being published because people want to read your books. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I think that, like, when we, like, the stage that we're in, so sort of like mid-career, you know, but we have been established so far, I think it's our responsibility to change something, to yeah. contribute something positive to how, you know, to, to the whole state of affairs, to how the artists are being treated or mistreated or something, because it, it is criminal. You know, it's not my problem that, you know, big corporations are swallowing small publishers and that the bookshops cannot, you know, I used to think that, you know, bookshops are, you know, the the heart uh, of our industry. No, the artists are the heart of the industry. Without us, there would be no fucking books. So at this point, my priority and my, my main concern is the artist, the creator. Yeah. Sense. You know what I mean? Yeah, right on. I went to France to write a book about bookshops because <laughs> I was in love with French bookshops. Yeah. And well, then I was, how many publishers do you have for the for your books? Like uh, are they translated all over the world? I mean, I know Italy, France, you know, North America. And- okay, so so for Betsy Mena, I've gotten um english american french italian uh spanish brazilian wow we sold the rights to danish rights we sold czech rights serbian croatian slovenian i am maybe forgetting some but yeah like it's pretty much every language like ma- major language so far Great. and I, I met I met uh, I met a Russian publisher in Angoulême during the festival. Uh-huh. And he, he was like, "No, I could never publish the book in Russia. Never." Oh, never. that's interesting. I wonder why. Very strong censors. I uh, see. They, you know, I have a Russian publisher for Fonte Bukowski. Yeah. And uh, I saw him at Angoulême, and I said, Is that uh, Dimitri? Yes." The same guy? Awesome. He's awesome. Okay. He, I was like, how's the how's the book selling? He's like, not well. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah. R- Russians don't like Fonte Bukowski. Oh, damn. <laughs> yeah. I've seen Dune for the first time in my life. The David Lynch version? Yeah. I've never watched that. Was it good or not? It's really good. And then I realized that in grade five, I wrote a book report on it. <laughs> really? And, <laughs> and... <laughs> you realized and, that you did? And then I remember I had a teacher. This is grade five. My homeroom teacher was like the Serbian literature teacher. And he hated my guts. <laughs> he hated me. And I remember I handed him this book report and he returned it to me and he was like, I don't understand a word, you know? And I was like, and then there was this big creature in the water. It looked like a worm or a fetus. 
and it was fake, you know? And like, I didn't make any fucking sense. All I remember, I was completely mesmerized by it. But it really, it really is an interesting film. One thing I don't, I'm not necessarily crazy about in Lynch's Dune is Sting. I'm like, really? Sting? Oh, yeah. You didn't like Sting when you were young? I kind of liked them in the in police, but um, then he became the crooning Englishman in New York that was kind of like, nah. Yeah. And that's that's the sting of my youth because I, you know, I came of age in mid eighties, so that was the sting I remember. Yeah, I had my sting because I, I mean, I was my heyday was like the nineties. My thing was like that weird, like new agey kind of Enya version of Sting. Enya, Enya version of Sting. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like I dream of rain and rain. And rain. <laughs> that was my thing. What really appeals to me is stretching the medium and experimenting with the medium. Um, like Bessie Mena is already not your typical comics layout, right? Yeah, it's true. And I want to stretch that a little bit more. So what is sequential art? Sequential art is using the image, the visual image in combination with text. Or you can just use visual image. It doesn't matter. You can have silent comics. I mean, you can argue that hieroglyphs were sequential art because they told the story through pictograms, through pictures. So the point is to tell a story with pictures and with the narrative, but does it need bubbles? Does it need, you know, speech and thought bubbles and, and frames? That's a question mark. So the next book will still be sequential art, but it will definitely not look like your typical comic. And so, I, I, yeah. Wow. What do you think the future will be like for comics? Do you think everything's going to be okay? Oh, I think it's probably the only book form that will survive in print. But all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop recording now because it's been an hour and a half, which is... Really? Yeah. Look at me, make a well, 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 look who made it to the end of the clip again. <laughs>